The philosophers of ancient Greece started to ponder what the world was made of, and the alchemists of the Middle Ages developed methods for studying it. For a long time it was thought that everything was made of earth, wind, fire and water, in different combinations, and even if the philosopher Democritus thought that perhaps there was some smallest indivisible particle, an atom, it wasn't until the 19th century that scientists started to realize that Democritus actually was right. Sort of. Down here you can see a timeline of different events that are important for the discovery of the atom and the emergence of an atomic theory. It starts here in 1805 and ends more than a hundred years later in 1932. Oh, and I don't think it's necessary that you copy this timeline. So what happened in 1805? Well, I would like to introduce you to John Dalton. He had first studied meteorology and then continued by studying gases and their properties. The results of his experiments could be explained if one considered the gases as made of tiny particles, marble-like atoms, whose mass decided the atom's properties. In this way, Dalton proposed the first scientific atomic theory and is often credited with being the father of the atomic theory. The Swedish chemist Jens Jakob Berzelius expanded on Dalton's atomic theory and in 1818 he published a table with the relative atomic weights of the elements that had been discovered until then. You could say that Berzelius sorted the atoms from the lightest to the heaviest. This was something that Dmitry Mendeleev took advantage of when he published his periodic table in 1869. So you see, in science each new piece of knowledge is always built on some older knowledge and then developed in different directions. I'll talk more about the periodic table in later videos. Right now we'll concentrate on the development of the atomic theory. Let's move on to 1896 and a French physicist named Henri Becquerel. He examined uranium salts and discovered that if you put them on a photographic plate, the plate was exposed, even if it hadn't been exposed to light. Becquerel understood that the uranium salt must have emitted some kind of rays. Could it be X-rays? No, Becquerel could show that it was some other kind of radiation. The radiation from the uranium salts appear when the uranium decays and turns into other elements. This was something that Marie Curie discovered when she studied the radiation from radium, among other elements. She actually coined the term radioactivity, and for her work on radioactivity she was awarded with the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with her husband Pierre and with Henri Becquerel. The conclusion that I want you to understand right here is that they discovered that the atom was in no way indivisible. It must consist of other smaller parts. But this of course begs the question, if the atom isn't indivisible, what is it made of? A part of the answer came from the British physicist J.J. Thomson and the experiments he made. He used a cathode ray tube like this one. When Thomson applied a strong voltage over the plates here and here, there appeared what was called a cathode ray, like this. This metal cross in the middle of the tube casts a shadow on the back of the tube. But then Thomson did something clever. He examined what happened with the ray if he applied a magnet to it, like this. Can you see that the shadow moved and that the cathode ray is bent? Now look at the magnet up here and you'll see that it is red to the left and blue to the right. If we turn the magnet around so we get red to the right and blue to the left, the cathode ray is bent the other way. In this way Thomson could conclude that the ray was actually a continuous stream of negatively charged particles. The particles were named electrons from a Greek word that means amber, since a cat's skin that is rubbed against the amber becomes electrically charged. Thanks to his experiments, Thomson could put forward a new, improved version of the atomic model, the so-called plum pudding model. 
He imagined that the atom was a positively charged mass with negatively charged electrons spread throughout the atom, somewhat like the plums in a classical English plum pudding. Now, this was a good theory, but a theory always has to be tested with experiment. Another British scientist, Ernest Rutherford, performed a very elegant experiment. Here you can see what it looked like. Over here he had a radioactive sample that continuously sent out so-called alpha particles. They entered here and hit a thin gold foil that was placed in the center. Now, if the atom looked like Thomson had proposed, the alpha particles should pass right through the thin gold foil. And indeed, most of them did. But about 1 in 8000 particles bounced off in a completely different direction. This could only be explained if the atom was instead mostly void and almost all of its mass concentrated in a solid kernel, the atomic nucleus. This is because it was the nucleus that made the alpha particles bounce off. The nucleus is positively charged and Rutherford proposed that the electrons circle around the nucleus more or less like the planets circle around the sun. There was only one problem with Rutherford's atomic model. It was completely unlikely, if not impossible. Classical physics tells us that the electrons in a fraction of a second should fall back into the nucleus and not circle around it at all. But why didn't they? The enigma was solved by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who in 1913 could present an even more improved atomic theory. And he did this by studying what is called the emission spectrum of hydrogen. If you add energy to a hydrogen atom, you make the atom send out, that is, emit, light. But as you can see, it's not all the colors of the rainbow that are emitted, but only certain colors. Which color the light has depends on how much energy there is in it. The bluer the light is, the more energy rich it is. But why does the atom send out any light at all when you add energy to it? Imagine this, that you lift up a rock from the ground. What happens is that you add energy to the rock, potential energy. When you release the rock, the potential energy is first converted into kinetic energy. When the rock hits the ground, the kinetic energy is converted into heat, or thermal energy, which radiates from the ground. The same thing happens with the electrons in an atom. If we add energy to the electron, it is lifted away from the nucleus. When the electron falls back towards the nucleus, its potential energy is converted into light, another kind of energy, which radiates out from the atom. But as you can see from the spectrum, there were only specific energies that were emitted from the atom. What Niels Bohr realized was that this means that the electrons can only stay in certain shells or energy levels around the nucleus. This is precisely what is shown here, that when an electron falls back from an outer shell to an inner, energy is given off in the form of light. The innermost shell is called K, and after that follows L, then M, and so on. Bohr's atomic model is really good, and you can use it to describe the hydrogen atom very well. But it has its limitations. The electron shells are not as simple as first thought. That is, the orbits around the nucleus aren't all circular. And the electrons aren't simply little marbles with negative charge, but rather smeared in time and space so that you can only tell with some probability where an electron is and where it's going. Because of this, we actually rather say that the electrons are in an electron cloud than an electron shell. A few years after this, Rutherford also discovered the proton. Almost immediately, he realized that there must be yet another building block in the atom. This is because positive charges repel each other, thus there must be some kind of glue that makes the protons stick together in the nucleus. It was Rutherford's student, James Chadwick, who in 1932 discovered the neutron, which had been predicted by Rutherford. So, in 1932, 
all the main building blocks of the atom had been discovered. But nuclear physicists weren't yet satisfied. Can we divide the protons and the neutrons further? Yes, we can. But this is beyond the scope of this chemistry course, and I will not dive into that here. Instead, we can now summarize what the main building blocks of the atom are. We have the electrons with a charge of minus 1, and we write them E minus. They can only be found in certain energy levels or shells around the nucleus. The protons have a charge of plus 1, and we write them P plus. They can be found in the atomic nucleus. And finally, we have the neutrons. They are uncharged, that is, they have no charge at all. We write them N, and they are also found in the nucleus.